very much for that introduction. Um, thank you very much to the Minus Science Center for the invitation to be here. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I'm excited to be here and talk to you about my research on invasive species. Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, detection of invasive species using environmental DNA. I'm going to get into that in a couple minutes, but because I'm first on the playlist here, I thought I'd start with uh, uh, set the stage here, the, the nature of the problem that we'll be talking about today. Biological invasion, invasive species. Now what you see here is a video, it's a 24 hour time lapse of all the air traffic across the globe. Each one of those little yellow dots represents an airplane flying around. Okay, this is great. Uh, people and products are able to move around the globe further distances and at uh, greater speeds than ever before. But at the same time, all these little, all these little yellow dots flying around, all this movement is an opportunity for plants, animals, disease vectors to move around the globe as well. And these organisms that are part of the natural history and the landscape someplace in the world get moved someplace else to what we call invasive species. And invasive species have really important environmental and economic impacts. They're among the most important drivers of global biodiversity loss, second only to habitat destruction. And they cost a lot of money on the order of $120 billion a year in the United States alone. They come in all shapes and sizes terrestrial species, the little fire ant, to the vine that ate the south kudzu, the aquatic species, the little zebra mussel about the size of your thumbnail, uh, to these gigantic 100 pound Asian carp uh, that are jumping out of the water here. And some of them are introduced intentionally, like our tilapia, we might be eating tilapia for dinner some night this week. Um, while some are accidental, either an accidental release like a South American apple snail from the aquarium trade, um, or something like our zebra mussels that came over and bounced from us. Now the invasion, it's useful to think about invasions as a process. It starts with species in their native habitat, species where they belong. Those species enter a transport pathway of some sort. Either we collect them because we want to trade them, or they get taken up into a ballast tank accidentally and they're gonna hitchhike across the globe. Those species are then transported and released alive someplace new. They establish a self-sustaining population, a reproductive population in a new habitat. And then they spread and cause those environmental and economic impacts that I talked about before. Now it's useful to think about the biological invasion process this way because each one of those steps represents an opportunity to target specific management actions. We can prevent those species from being, injured, from being taken up into a pathway. We can try and detect and prevent species from becoming established. Um, and even down here where species are spreading, they're here to stay and they're causing environmental impacts. As managers, we can adapt human behavior and try to mitigate those costs, try to bear those costs. You'll see that each one of these steps in the invasion process is represented by a smaller and smaller arrow. And that's because conceptually we can think of each one of these steps as a filter that a species has to go through before it's, it's down here on our bad invasive list. So my research focuses on as the introduction said, predicting biological invasions, trying to predict species as they move from step to step. And one of the tools that we use to do that is, is uh, genetic tools. Now some invasive species, like these Asian carp jumping out of the Mississippi River, it's pretty easy to know where they are, right? You throw your, your motor through the water, um, and defensively they jump out of the water. It's 100 pound fish are jumping out of the water, um, trying to get away from that, that scary motor. But what? If you have an environment where 
the fish, the invaders aren't just jumping out in plain sight. What if we still want to know what might be in this in this environment? What if we've got something like a, a common carp, not to scale, uh, in, our, in, our, in our aquatic environment? Are there, are, yeah, right? are there other tools that we can use to, to figure out what whether this invasive species is in? Fortunately for us, um, species are always shedding material into their environment. You can keep people. You scratch your arm, <clears throat> you clear your throat, you're shedding a little bit of genetic material into the environment. And so these fish, as they swim, um, they've got mucus coming off of their body, the uh, water's passing over their gills because they're trying to breathe, and, and so they're sloughing off some cellular material. Uh, they're defecating and, and uh, urinating into the water. So they're, they're releasing all this genetic material. And so if we know a little bit about the genetics of this organism, the, the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's that make up its DNA, its unique DNA code, well, then that sets us up for uh, something that I like to refer to as the CSI, or your favorite crime show, environment. You can go out and look for, not the criminal at the crime scene by swallowing a cigarette butt and looking for his DNA, but the invasive species, or maybe the endangered species, or some other species of interest in our landscape, um, by looking for the genetic tools that they have. We call this environmental DNA. This is the genetic material that organisms are sloughing off into their environment. Um, and in particular, what's novel about uh, this environmental DNA approach is that we don't collect, we don't go out and collect specific sources of DNA. We're not setting out fur traps, we're not taking the time to collect individual scats. Instead, we're taking a, a soil sample. In my lab, we would probably break logs if we did this. We're taking a, a water sample. We're setting out a dust trap and collecting, collecting air. And all of these bulk environmental samples contain a mixture of DNA from organisms. And so if we know the DNA of the particular invasive species, endangered species, other species of interest um, that we're looking for, we can use standard laboratory techniques um, of DNA extraction and, and PCR, things that have been around for decades, to look for clues that our organism was there. Now, a lot of studies over the last 10 or so years have come out and demonstrated that we can do this pretty successfully, detecting American bullfrog, bullfrogs in Paris, detecting Asian carp in the Mississippi River, um, detecting uh, endangered species as well. What my lab is interested in, my research program focuses on um, the ecology of this eDNA, this genetic stuff. So after this stuff gets shed from an organism, it interacts with its environment in interesting ways. Um, and I'll point you towards this, uh, this recent review that came out uh, where we set up this framework and really outlined this, this research program. Um, and I'd like to take my last couple minutes here to, to walk you through um, this framework, this ecology of eDNA. It starts with the, the origin of eDNA. We know we're collecting genetic fragments from organisms, but remember I said it might be that stuff off of the gills, it might be feces, it might be mucus. Um, we don't have a great concept of where environmental, D, environmental DNA comes from. Um, and you can imagine, this is gonna be important, if it's from something like uh, reproductive fluids or, or defecation, we might see little spikes in DNA and then it goes away. But if it's something, if the source of DNA is more commonly something like decomposition um, or just that uh, mucus sloughing off the body, it might be around in, in more of a press pattern, um, around more commensurate and more um, commonly over time. This has implications for when and how we go out and sample this stuff. Now related to the origin of the DNA is the state of this stuff in the environment. We don't know, are these little small particles, are these free pieces of DNA floating around in the environment? Or is it uh, stuff wrapped up in organelles and, and cellular material, and big chunks of tissue? Um, and that has implications for our understanding of, of how we collect this stuff. So I show you here, if we use a very, if we've got a, a smattering of eDNA in our environment, 
and we use a really small filter, really small pore size, we're going to get a lot of genetic material from that water sample or that soil sample that we filter. If we use a coarser filter, we might get, I'm standing in front of it, we might get less DNA from that same sample. And if we're trying to relate, say, the amount of DNA we collect to the amount of organisms that are swimming around and crawling around, we're going to draw two really different conclusions just based on how we sample the same thing. Part of this ecology of eDNA framework, I'm also interested in the transport of DNA. <coughs> if DNA leaves this decapod crustacean, for example, and floats downstream right into our sample of water that we take, we would amplify that DNA and get what we would say is a true positive. We would detect the species in that environment. But if DNA settles, hangs around for a little while, and then gets transported by, say, wave action long after the crayfish leaves, or if DNA travels in the water column all the way downstream to some other habitat and we detect it then, that sets us up for a false positive. This isn't really coming from an organism present where we took that sample. And related to transport, is the fate of eDNA. So after DNA is produced, it's, it's in the environment, it's, it's transporting around, um, also interacting with this is its fate. How long does it stick around? We've got just one organism, and DNA, slow, DNA decays in the environment very slowly. That might lead us to one result. But if DNA is degrading really rapidly, a whole bunch of organisms might produce the same amount of DNA in the environment. Um, also did experiments where we look at how long this stuff sticks around. Is it commensurate with the presence of the organisms, um, or are we at risk of collecting uh, relics of, of organisms past? So when we put all of these together, the origin, state, transport, and fate of DNA, we get the ecology of environmental DNA. Add into that um, some of the chemistry and, and technological limitations that I'm not going to get into today. Um, and essentially, we've got my, my genetic uh, environmental DNA research program up here. And with that, um, I'm going to put my contact information up here for you. I'll thank you for your time. I wanted to plug, um, we've got, an, we've got a, a workshop coming up at the Ecological Society of America this summer. Um, on, again, this ecology of environmental DNA. And I'll, I'll finish by saying my interest is in detecting invasive species, maybe endangered species, other large organisms in the environment. But microecologists, hydrologists, uh, human genetic forensics experts are all interested in this um, genetic stuff, extra organismal genetic material in the environment. Um, and we're going to try and get some of those experts together to, um, to share trade secrets and an understanding of this extra organismal genetic material we're selling. Um, so if you're an ecologist, you're going to be here anyway, stop on by. If you're not an ecologist and want to uh, uh, join us, that would be extremely helpful to us. So I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions.